Well, hi everyone. You ready for part eight in this ongoing series? I think it'll go on for millions of years, but the part eight with Dr. Nathaniel Jensen on rewriting history. And today, well, you, you tell us, uh, Dr. Jensen, what's the topic today? Today, we're going to ask the question, how many people are of Mongol descent and don't know it? Mongol empire being the world's greatest empire and touched briefly in world history classes, if you take the history of Western civilization, but then largely ignored. And people who don't look East Asian with the typical slanted eyes that we say and so forth have probably never given it a second thought. And genetics has a lot to say about this in ways we wouldn't have expected and I wouldn't have expected. Well, this has really been a mind blowing series, if I can say that, as we start to really think through looking at genetics, as you've done, the Y chromosome differences particularly, and showing relationships that I think people are starting to say, wow. And looking at you know some of the people groups, ethnicities we see today and realize they're of recent origin. They, they just don't go back you know, as, as like we thought they did sort of thousands of years or something like that. So this is the new history of the human race. And by new history, you're not rewriting biblical history. You're also rewriting people's perception of history, particularly in regard to uh, people groups around the world. So this is absolutely fascinating. And so now we're going to get straight into part eight. And you can go to Answers in Genesis YouTube channel to be able to see all of this series. And we'll continue this series uh, on into the future. So we'll have a part nine and a part 10 and part 11 and a part 12. And we'll see how much further we can go on looking at all of this. So uh, Dr. Jensen, over to you for how many of you have Mongol descent and don't even know it? There we go. Now technology is cooperating. And this, again, just to put it in a larger context, is one of the sub-questions and the larger one, who do we come from? And on a personal note, having been involved in this directly myself, it's given a new perspective on the word foreign and when that word applies and when it doesn't. And we're, if you're like me, you're used to applying things, you're used to applying the word foreign to anyone who doesn't look like you, doesn't talk like you, doesn't act like you, isn't a resident in the same country as you. And to see the genealogical connections among people, it demolishes what I've taken for granted and makes me much more hesitant to use the term foreign. And we're going to see that played out again and again. Even these foreign, ancient, distant cultures take on a new perspective. We're going to discover that the idea that only modern Egyptians can claim the ancient Egyptians, only modern Greeks can claim the ancient Greeks. Those sorts of ideas take on a totally different perspective when we look at genetics and we see the connections among people. I've already mentioned the Mongol Empire. Here's a picture of it stretching from the Pacific into Eastern Europe. Greatest extent the world has ever seen. Massive empire. These are massive conquerors. 800 years ago, again, history of Western civilization mentions it because it gets into the West, it gets into Europe, but then it tends to ignore it. And we tend to ignore it, I don't think about it, except as something that's out there, the Far East. Yet, when we look at the family tree, we're gonna see this is brought much closer to home. In the first episode, we looked at the history of world population growth. The world is smaller than we think. Go back 600 years, and the world population is 20 times smaller than it is today. There's fewer somebodies to come from. This is going to force connections where we might not expect it. We've begun to see the implications of this, the ramifications of this in the family tree in the previous episode. We've also seen the ramifications of this. Theoretically, if you go back, multiply the number of your ancestors as you should. Two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16, 32, so forth. You'll find out that if a few hundred thousand years ago, you're going to have billions of ancestors. That can't possibly be true. Your parents must be more related to each other than you think. I'm much more related to myself than I think because of my parents' relationship, which I don't know what it is. I know in theory, though, it must be more close than I'm used to thinking. And it may have multiple ethnicities that I've not thought about. And your typical family tree DNA, one of these other commercial genetic tests, can't tell you that. Only 
the genetics we're uncovering can. And because of the math of human reproduction, where one family having four kids, one having two, one family having three kids, one having one, you can dramatically rewrite the ancestry of a people group in short order. It's theoretically possible most of Europe is of African descent. We've seen last time that there's a common ancestor between India, South Asia, and Europe in the 1500s that we didn't expect to see. And today we're going to try to figure out why that's the case. Our family tree is shorter than we think, much more shallow than we think. It's the Y chromosome, or in simpler terms, it's the male inherited DNA that's the key. This is number one because it's inherited only through one parent, so you can't dilute the genetic signal through DNA from the other parent. And secondly, for technical reasons, the statistics of it allow us to walk back every generation to the beginning, something that's more difficult to do with precision with mitochondrial DNA. You can still see that the family tree is short, shallow, just if 200 generations old or less, but you can't get as much detail as you can with the Y chromosome. That's why we're focusing on that. We've seen that there's lost relatives of Europe. We've begun to see that. We're going to see a whole lot more. And now we want to know, are there people of Mongol descent, Mongol ancestry who are roaming the planet, don't look Mongol at all, and they don't know it? We talked about this thousand genomes study, it's called a thousand genomes because they, they sampled about a uh, thousand to two thousand people around the globe in these 26 populations, these major sections of the globe. Again, we look at this and say, well, there's a lot of the planet that's not covered. We found last time that if you look at where the people are concentrated today, West Africa, Central Africa, India, Eastern China, Europe, these populations that they sampled represent the major population centers of the globe. So this is a good first past exploration. And this is the family tree then that results. I've color coded it. I've used these colors because they, they follow some of the precedents used in the popular literature and I'm trying to be consistent. We looked at this particular branch of the tree. We've seen that it was heavily populated with South Asians and Europeans. They have a common ancestor in the 1500s. These two very different looking people might share a recent common ancestor. I say might because Europeans and South Indians show up in other parts of the tree. So it's in a sense a statistical argument that you can only resolve if you get their DNA. You get the, the DNA of this lady's, the South Indians, actually she's a Sri Lankan Tamil or Sri Lankan lady. If you get her father's Y chromosome, and you get that, that uh, this man's Y chromosome DNA, you can directly answer that question. Last time though, we, we raised the issue of why would these two people groups be related so recently in the past, AD 1500. We talked about the presence of the British in India, that the stereotype we have is when the British Raj came, when the East India Company came to the, the, the Indian subcontinent, this was a clash of ancient civilizations, very different people groups, that was unprecedented. We've seen genetically, these, some of these people were actually close relatives. It may be tempting to say, well, couldn't this be an artifact of that? Are, are you misinterpreting this? Maybe all you're seeing is the echo of the British Raj in India, that it was an ancestral British population. They came over to India and they have left now descendants in the Indian subcontinent. What I didn't tell you, is that this particular branch of the tree represents 25% on average of people in the subcontinent. So there's a billion people, over a billion people alive today in India, 25% of them, hundreds of millions of Indian people are on this branch. So could it be that the British coming over in AD 1600, occupying territory they're ruling, were so active and intermarried so much that they could have given rise to 25% of the Indian population? It's possible. You can run the math and see the reproductive rates. It's possible. I don't think that's the explanation though. That's the, that's the mystery we wanna to try to solve today. What events explain why these two groups, widely geographically separated, linguistically separated, physically different, culturally different, why might they be so connected? What historical events could explain this? Well, to, to gain some more clues, I want to look at another study. So this study that I called the 1000 Genomes Project was a narrow section of the world populace, narrow in its ethnic sampling. There's only 26 populations, but it was deep. They took about 
50, 40 to 50 men on average from each of these populations. There's another study that came out in 2015 that was more of a wide but shallow study of the world's populations. You can see there's many more stars in this graph. There's much more of the map that's filled in. Not so much in the Americas, but in Asia in particular, there's a whole lot more sampled. So this particular study looked at, I think it was around 170 different groups. So instead of 26, it's 170, yet they only took two, three, four, five men on average from these populations. So it's a much wider swath of the ethno-linguistic groups on the globe, but more shallow. You only take a few men from it. This is the family tree that results. We're going to look at both that thousand genomes one and this tree in much more depth in this episode. And as we go on, this is again a zoomed out view. You can see similar structures in these trees. That point will become clear as we get into the details. Again, I'm putting Noah about there. He could be maybe right there and right there, and that may not look much on your screen. When we get to the ancient history, we'll, we'll discuss this in more depth. The point being, there's a little bit of uncertainty here that affects the dates, so these are round numbers. Again, I'm using 1990 as the present date. It could be 1950 instead of 2020, because we're looking at the birth years of the participants, and the participants are adults. There's more colors now. It's not just South Asians, Europeans, Americas, East Asians, and Africans. We've got people from the Middle East, the Near East. So Iran, Iraq, there's the Caucasus mountain region. I'll point that out in the map shortly. There's people from Oceania. What I mean here is people from Papua New Guinea that weren't in the previous study. There's Siberian populations that we weren't able to see before and Central Asians. And I'll talk about what this means geographically in a moment. We can find the similar branch that we were talking about up here on the tree again we'll find the same similar South Asian European populations plus more. And they'll give us some clues as to the historical explanation for the connections. So down here again in gold are the European populations. Notice there's a Near Eastern, Middle Eastern one here as well. Here, 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 those are some of the red ones. I'll zoom in here so you can see the specifics. In this neon green are the Central Asians. Many of the Stans, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, many of the other Stans that we don't think about, but were that used to be part of the USSR. They're sort of in between China and, and Afghanistan, Pakistan, these other Stans. So you can see then the, the other groups represented. Some in pink here, some of the Siberians ones. So let's zoom in and see specifically what I'm talking about. Here at the top, Central Asians. When I say Central Asians, it's some of the former Russian republics, the Stans, like Kazakhstan. So there's a Kazakhstani man in here. Every branch represents a single male. There's Iraqi Jews present in red, so red because they're Middle Eastern. You can see again that the darker green being some of these South Asian populations, Bengalis from Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, Orissa, these are just sections of India, states in India, and men from these people groups there. Tajikistan in neon green, Cossacks are an Eastern European group. Tajiks, and I should say this particular study did a, did, a, did a much broader sampling of these Eastern European groups that we don't typically talk about. They had a heavy emphasis in Eastern Europe that'll become significant momentarily. More Tajiks, Tajiks. Altaians are sort of Northwest of China there, the Altaian Mountains, Siberian area. Kyrgyzstan here, you can see Assyrians near the Caucasus region. Ashkenazi Jews I've put in gold because they were residing in Europe when they were sampled. Balkars, a Near Eastern group. If we go on down, there's some more Jews, Mumbai Jews. They're in India, though. More Tajiks, Circassians. This is, again, around the, they were sampled around the, the Caucasus region. These are the mountains. Think Georgia, Armenia, sort of if you go north from Iraq. I'll show you on the map shortly. Tajiks, Azerbaijanis, Iranians. You can see there's a whole sampling of peoples. If we go down to the gold part, Hungarians, Cossacks, Ukrainians. There's a whole bunch of Ukrainians in this group. Mordvins. Tatars, Cossacks, there's a whole bunch of people groups that we don't think about in Russia, minority groups that aren't necessarily ethnically Russian. They're in the western part of Russia, the part of Russia we classify as Europe. You're going to see a lot of them here in this, in this particular study. There's Swedish people, Samis are Scandinavians, very north Scandinavia, central Russians, Ukrainians, Estonians, former USSR, Karelians are more Russians, a group in Russia. Komis are in Russia, Bashkir, so forth. So that's the individuals who are present, a lot of unfamiliar people groups. But on the map, if we're talking about Europe and South Asia, there's a whole bunch here. So there's the Ukrainians, there's Belarus, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are right here. The 
the Sami peoples are up north Scandinavia here. I mentioned the Swedes. I'm showing here the other populations that we saw in the 1000 genomes, the British, the Spanish, the Tuscanis, the, the, the Finnish. There's a lot of people groups here. When I say Russia, the, the Comis, Karelians, they, sh they show up in this part of Russia. When I said the Caucasus region, those are the mountains down here. Armenia, see if you, here's Iraq, Iran, if you go north, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people groups and languages that show up here for reasons that we, we might discuss in subsequent episodes. So last time we said there's a connection between Europe and India. And if, if you've taken Western civilization, the only thing that might come to mind is, well, there was this age of exploration. Various European countries went and tried to colonize the globe. The British came to India. So isn't that the most natural explanation for why there's this recent connection between the two? You might have to fudge about 100 years or so in the dates, but doesn't that make more sense? Well, what we've just seen is on that same branch are a whole bunch of people groups that geographically connect and lie between the two. So the Near East and then the Stans, the, the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, those all show up right here, former USSR. And the Altai, the si Siberian people group is right here. So it's, when I said Northwest China, these are the mountains over here. You can see that people on the, on the same branches with Europeans and South Asians, they're geographically between the two. I can't think of any British exploration that goes into the Stans Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, that explains this. So that's one of the reasons why I don't think that's the explanation for why Europe and India are genealogically connected. Before we get into that, though, let's just stop and reflect. We've said the people of India are some of the lost relatives of Europe. So are people in the Near East and in the Stans. The people you're seeing here on the screen have a good chance of being recent relatives. So I think of my relatives in terms of my immediate family. I think of Europeans, Caucasian looking people like this man over here as likely in the family tree at some point. I rarely think of Middle Easterners, people from India, people from East Asia, Central Asia as my relatives. Yet this is what the tree is saying. These are some of the lost relatives of Europe. The world is smaller than we think. Our family trees are more connected than we think. Racial or ethnic change can happen faster than we think. You see, you see how different those people look. Our family tree is much more shallow than we think. Those are all the reasons. The first six episodes are the reasons why this is possible. It's just not something we'd expect. So what is the explanation? I think there's a, there's a fairly plausible explanation. I should state here, though, that this is research in progress. These explanations may change in light of the current evidence that we have. I think what I'm about to tell you makes sense of what we see. So just to have that little asterisk, this is again research in progress. By the time the book comes out, it'll be the state of affairs at that time when I write it. Here's what I think is the state of affairs right now. I wanna highlight a geographic component in these branches of the family tree that, that has a role to play in how we think about why this came about. So I'm highlighting here Europe from the Ural Mountains in Russia all the way over to Iceland. I wanna break this yellow highlighted section of Europe into two parts, east and west. I want to call this the eastern part. So you've got Russia, maybe some of Finland, Sweden, a lot of the former USSR republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, Belarus, so forth. Poland, some of the Balkan Peninsula, Czechoslovakia. That's it's, it's sort of a rough line there. I'm going to call that all that Eastern Europe. And then call this other half Western Europe, Germany, Italy, Spain, France, Portugal, UK, Norway, Iceland. Why do I break it up this way? Well, this particular branch of the family tree is present in Western Europe, British, so forth, only at 5%. If you look at Western Europeans generally, only about 5% of them or less on average show up in this particular part of the tree. Eastern Europeans, the Russians and those minority groups in Russia, 35%, a full third. So there's a pretty strong skewing, seven times more concentrated in Eastern Europe than in Western Europe. So 95% of Western Europeans are not on this branch. A third of Eastern Europeans, you'll find them here. So if I were to draw this map again with these stars, a more realistic picture would be to emphasize, excuse me, emphasize the Eastern European part over the Western European part. And a more appropriate picture then to visualize who's related would not be to use a, a Western European individual, but more of an Eastern European individual. These people are close relatives is what the family tree says. Okay, well, this is interesting. Eastern Europe, the Mongol Empire stretched from the Pacific 
and went into Eastern Europe, not Western Europe. It also reaches down into the Middle East, covers Central Asia. It connects a lot of these groups that we just discussed. Doesn't get into India, so there's a little question mark we have to add. But in terms of explaining the geography of this, okay, we're, we're, we seem to be along the right track. But how do we explain India? Why is Europe and India connected? The Mongol Empire doesn't seem to explain it. And if we think about the dates, this is the 1200s when these conquests happen. This is several hundred years before AD 1500. So are there any other candidate historical events to explain what we see? Well, one thing I've had to learn, because this isn't typically taught in history of Western civilization, is that after the Mongol Empire, it's split up into several four major khanates. There's a, there's a khanate then here in, in the Middle East, there's one in Central Asia, there's one in East Asia, China and so forth, and then one that sits around here in Europe. That's the one I want to emphasize. It's also known as the Golden Horde. The Golden Horde doesn't just reach into Eastern Europe, conquer it, and then go away. They're hanging out here and ruling for 200 years. So the, the, the major Mongol Empire, think of it as stopping maybe around 1300. For 200 years, the Golden Horde there is present. These Central Asians, East Asians, the Mongolians are present here in Eastern Europe. Then what? Well, what's the origin of modern Russia? I'm going to show you here. There's a lot of colors on the screen. I want to emphasize the green aspect with some dates. This is showing you the progress of Russian expansion, primarily post-1500, that gave rise to the Russian state as we're used to thinking about it today. And the various shades of green represent stages of the expansion. Let me give you the dates for this. So the earliest parts here are dark green around Moscow what we know as modern Moscow. By 1505, the Russians were beginning to push out the Golden Horde, push out these Mongolians, and, and conquer territory that would become modern Russia. By 1505, they'd reached that extent, right here, that border. By 1592, they'd reached that border. By the 1600s, they had gone all the way into Siberia. And then these other colors represent other stages of their expansion. What I want you to see, though, that the beginning of the Russian expansion has a strong correlation with the date that I've just given for the branching points of this tree. At 1500 is when you see the European block begin to emerge and separate from the India block. Well, that's the European side of the equation. What about India? If we think of the present state of India and go backwards in time, so India is an independent country. It achieved its independence from the British Raj in the, the mid 1900s. Well, what happened to the British before the British Raj? When the British, the East India Company landed on the Indian shores, who did they encounter? Well, the empire that was ruling India at that time was the Mughal Empire. What's the Mughal Empire? It's a word that's derived from the Persian word Mughal. The Persian word Mughal is the Persian word for Mongol. And the reason it's called a Mongol Empire is because the Mughal Empire was started by Mongols who came down from the north, guess when? The 1500s. Started in the early 1500s, came in, went out, came back. How interesting that the Mongols are being pushed out of Russia and into India right around this time. So how do we make sense of this map? I think we've got a plausible explanation, known historical events, not events typically covered in the history of Western civilization, but ones that are documented. In the 1200s, you've got a, a group of Mongol conquerors who decide to go on the, in an expansion, a, a conquest that's the greatest the world has ever seen, eventually stretching their empire from the Pacific all the way over into Eastern Europe. Well, in short order, this empire breaks up into its component parts ruled by Mongolians. There's a, there's a chunk here in gold that camps out in Eastern Europe for 200 years, 1300s to 1500s. Intermixing surely happens. Multiplication of people surely happens. We know that the world population growth curve begins to shoot upwards in the 1500s. Well, by that point, the Russians decide they've had enough and begin to push out the Mongolians around 1500 and expand eastward. Presumably, some of these Mongolians had descendants who intermixed. Some decided to leave. Russians, of course, eventually expand into the Kazakhstans and Tajikistans and the Stans up there. Some of these folks probably take up residence there as well who are leaving the Russian expansion. Some eventually end up in the Middle East. And of course, around about that same time, Mongols come down into India and form the Mughal Empire, which is the empire that's ruling when the British arrive. There's the extent of that. 
and intermix with the population, eventually giving rise to 25% of the Indian population today, which is extremely plausible. Episode four covers how slight differences in reproductive rates from a small starting population can lead to dominance or a, a significant presence in the population today. So those events, I think, are a plausible explanation for the relationships we see among these peoples today. So how many people are of Mongol descent? What I'm saying is that branch of the family tree looks like it's the result of the Mongol expansion. And the Mongols have left a genetic, a genealogical footprint in Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and in India in ways we never would have expected today. The politics change, and we naturally assume the peoples change then as well, that there's no relationship among them. Well, because the world is smaller than we think, our genealogical trees are more connected than we think, and for all the reasons we've discussed in previous episodes, that doesn't play out that way. Only the family can, tree can tell us how things have played out, and all these various peoples look like they are of Mongol descent. We're just scratching the surface in terms of the relationships among peoples around the globe. We've looked at just one branch, lost relatives of Europe and lost connections among big swaths of Asia and Europe in ways we might have never expected. This is the new history of the human race because this is data, this is genetic insights we've not had before and, we've, and, and you won't have anywhere but here. So uh, Dr. Jensen, as we look at this, I mean, I'm Australian, right? And of course, we have an indigenous people called the Australian Aboriginals. Has any genetic work been done to trace their ancestry and when they may have come to Australia? And is that in any future episodes? Yes, what we're gonna discuss in uh, next week is the history of Western Europe. So we can see here that, that the, the connection between Europe and India is heavily concentrated in Eastern Europe. We're gonna look at Western Europe. So you and I, we're gonna discuss next time how much of the Americas, Australia, basically, we think of us having a Western European heritage. What does that mean? Who do Western Europeans come from? And is it even right to talk about the Americas as being of Western European descent? Who came after Columbus? So we'll focus on that in subsequent episodes. This will naturally lead into, for reasons we'll discover, the pre-Columbian history of the Americas, which raises the question of what does it mean to be indigenous? And then after that is when we're gonna get into the question of what does it mean to be indigenous? How do we answer that question around the globe? What about indigenous Australia, Papua New Guinea, China, Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa? Are there any indigenous Europeans? When we talk about Europeans, we're talking about a geographic entity, but when we talk about genetic heritage, genealogical heritage, can we even answer that question? So we're gonna, we're gonna hit all of those regions of the globe as we go forward and move from the present era backwards in time to the beginning. You know, I was thinking, you know, when people look at what you're saying and they say, but wait a minute, could, could you really have people in someone's ancestry that looks so, seems to on the outside look so different uh, from them, although the differences aren't that ma major anyway, the difference is really quite minor. But you know, my, my wife, uh, many people probably don't know this, but her great grandfather was Chinese. And you would never know that looking at her, that her great grandfather was Chinese, came from Canton in China. And so uh, for my wife on her father's side, it's Chinese, on her mother's side, it's German. And on my side is English and Irish. So in our children, uh, it's really not that far back in their ancestry. They have, you know, a great, uh, great grandfather that's Chinese, and yet you would never know it looking at them or our grandchildren. So those differences that we see are really minor differences, but they, they can happen very quickly. Yes. And in episode three, when we talked about these changes, we focused heavily just on one aspect of it, the physical differences that we tend to notice, namely skin tone. Well, there's a whole slew of features, especially in the face, that our brains recognize we're forming mental patterns constantly of the people we encounter and there's a whole slew of characteristics that go into what we call race or ethnicity and i've begun to notice and, and begun to look for some of these signatures we haven't paid attention to so take an example uh, melania trump look at the shape of her eyes and she's you could call eastern european balkan peninsula yugoslavia that sort of area and if you look at the eye shape of many people in Eastern Europe, 
I'm beginning to notice things that might in fact be the echoes of the Mongol interaction. They have light skin. Mongols were a small people group that came into a European population size that was likely much larger. So you wouldn't expect the minority group to then, in terms of physical characteristics, take over the majority group. But you might expect to see certain aspects still persist, mm -hmm. maybe eye shape, but with European skin tone. It's, it's a mosaic that results. And seeing these genetic data and having them in hand now for several months to a year or two has changed how I look at even various European subgroups, European geography, people from various European geographies and say, I don't think that feature of yours comes from where you think it is. And it's these sorts of genetic connections that have made me look at humanity in a whole new way. I'm amazed that uh, you, know, you have a PhD from Harvard University in biology. Well, it's more than biology, but uh, that's basically your PhD, correct? Yes. And, and yet, you've learned all this information about history. So you had to study history to be able to even work this in with your genetics research. Yes. When I, when I began to see the connections among these peoples, and, and part of the reason I said this can't possibly be true is because my history is basically, last time I took a class was high school, world history, which is essentially history of Western civilization. So I've had to do massive remedial education and saying, okay, what is known from historical documents, archaeology, about the sequence of events in China, in India, in Papua New Guinea, and discover how much has been documented in some of these places and how much still is unknown about, let's say, pre-colonial Australia, pre-colonial Papua New Guinea, the Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, so forth. So it's, it's been a fantastic learning experience. Fun because I have this goal in mind of, we've got these branches, why in the world are these people connected? And so many times, and I should say, I, I began this process thinking, wow, we're really rewriting history. And I've had to back off some of that and say, no, it's actually all there. <laughs> all the stuff that the history books talk about is there. The echoes are there if you know what you're looking for. And this to me is a testament to the power of the young earth timescale. You, you see these events, the dates I'm giving are only manifest, they're only calculable if you have a 4,500 year framework. Those points on the tree get totally different dates. And outside the realm of history of civilization, if you view it through an evolutionary lens of 200,000 years, they don't see these effects of history. And so the fact that we can see these events of history echoed in our DNA, that it makes sense, is itself a testament that this is real history, this is a real time scale, this is a superior way of looking at the world, this type of information you don't get to the commercial testing genetic companies because they're adopting the mainstream time scale and they therefore cannot tell you. You're gonna bump back that 80, 1500 date, that branch, who knows, into the 4,000s, 10,000s, it's somewhere back in the distant past that has very little relationship to anything we call history. So what we're seeing is only possible because we have the biblical framework through which to interpret the data. And then when we line it up with history, even evolutionists would accept. No one, no evolutionist would deny the Russian expansion, the 1500s, the Mongol, the Mughal Empire, India. This is all stuff they'd say, yeah, that was true. And then when I say, look, here it is in genetics. Wait, what? This is the sort of thing that should not be true if evolution is true. And it's a strong confirmation of the reliability of the biblical history and especially of the time scale. And you know, um, if I can just uh, add something here, I think this is just a good teaching point in regard to the Ministry of Answers and Genesis. When you walk into the Creation Museum, and through the main exhibits, as you start there, we have what's called the starting points room to show people, look, everybody in this world has the same evidence in the present. But if your starting point is God's word, then you have a particular framework, a particular worldview that comes out of that, which you use to look at the evidence, interpret the evidence. But if you start with an evolutionary view of history and reject God's word, you've got a whole different worldview. And if people don't have the right foundation, and therefore the right worldview, they won't interpret this evidence correctly. So the evidence is all there, but the trouble is people are being taught in their schools and universities from an evolutionary foundational perspective, which has a, a different worldview. So they're interpreting this evidence incorrectly. When you look at it through the right lens, the lens of scripture, it all makes sense. And then the thing is observational science and genetics is confirming that biblical history. It's not confirming 
the evolutionary one. And, you know, that, that's, that's what's amazing to me when, when people see this, when non-Christians, when evolutionists see what you're saying and see that it's the biblical framework that explains the genetics that you see there, it all fits together. I mean, what are they doing? What are they saying? Largely ignoring it, which is the typical evolutionary response. I don't think they're prepared for it. In, in terms of the larger creation evolution debate, you, you look at what happened in the 1970s with Henry Morris and Duane Gish, the evolutionists admit we were basically caught off guard. We weren't expecting people to give scientific arguments. They, they were expecting Bible, basically. You're going to quote the Bible, use Bible verses, and we're going to have the science over here and, and see so you don't know what you're talking about. When, the, when they came and said, no, look, look at the fossil record. Look at these geological layers. Look at the genetics, which is what we can talk about more now and didn't, they didn't have access to back then. 1970s, they say we were caught off guard. And so you see a lot of court cases in the 1980s because they finally said, let's get organized. This is a different type of opponent that we have to deal with. And then they won a, a number of court cases in which their major argument was, all you guys do is criticize evolution. You don't give anything positive. Well, what we're doing right here is rendering that legal argument null and void. The stuff that's in the books and say, this is, this is why you cannot teach creation in the schools. This is why it's just religion. All of that is completely useless and irrelevant. And they're, I think we're gonna catch them off guard again because this, this is positive. Here's what we're doing. We're making, making testable predictions that we can go out and confirm in the natural world. This is advancing understanding. We're breaking new ground that no one else has gone before. People have not gone this way before. They've not seen these echoes before. And I don't think any of them are prepared for, wait, what? Roles are gonna reverse. For, for years, creationists have been saying, here's what's wrong with evolution. Therefore, we should trust creation. They're going to have to now say, well, here's, they're going to have to nitpick what we're saying, and they're going to be stuck in the defensive end of the, end of the game. We're going to be on the offensive, and I don't think they're prepared for that. You know, the same sort of thing is happening in the climate change debate, because I hear the secularists out there claiming, oh, you Christians, you're climate change deniers. You creationists, you're climate change deniers. We're not climate change deniers, but we have a different framework. If you start from a biblical framework and the flood caused massive climate change, and then there's been climate change ever since the flood. And also to know that when you're looking at interpreting evidence in the present in relation to the past or predicting models for the future, there are assumptions. And if you've got the wrong assumptions, the wrong foundation of the wrong interpretation, hey, the same applies to this coronavirus situation. There's been many, many models predicting things that haven't worked out and they're conflicting models. And why, why is that? Because anytime you're you're developing models like that, you have certain assumptions. If your assumptions are wrong, your model's gonna be wrong. We need to be asking what the assumptions are. And yet I hear, I hear people saying, oh, you have gotta to listen to the science of, of all of this. But even the science in regard to the coronavirus, well, it, you know, what they're saying is science can be based on assumptions which can give uh, wrong models and predict wrong things. Is that correct? Yeah, and if I can state it even more provocatively, perhaps, than what I'm used to stating it as, and the, the climate change is a very apropos comparison here because what have we heard from the other side? Well, there's this hockey stick shape. And if you deny the hockey stick shape of changes in global temperature or whatever it is, you're a denier. Well, here we have a hockey stick shape for human population growth. We see the echo in genetics when we view it through the lens of 4,500 years. If people reject it, who's, this, who's the science denier now? It's it's right. a really crazy reversal of roles where the playbook is almost the same transposed now to the genetic side, but with roles reversed. And I'm, I'm very curious to see how they react to a parallel situation in which I could just as easily use all the phrases, uh, criticisms and everything else they've been using against us. I wanna see how they respond to that if they now reject all the arguments they've been using and calling us deniers and so forth, or, or what sort of tactic they employ. And you know, a lot of this comes down to what I did at the Bill Nye debate with Bill Nye. The first thing I did was define science. The difference between observational science, what you directly observe, and historical science, your beliefs uh, about the past in particular, that determine how you interpret the evidence of the present. Creation scientists like yourself understand the difference between observational and historical science, whereas I find the secularists don't want to admit that at all, they deny it, and so therefore they, they will, don't want to understand or will not understand or reject uh, the interpretation that you have, and yet what you see in genetics is fits directly 
with that biblical history. Well, we look forward to parts nine and parts 10. What, what are we doing in part nine and part 10? We're gonna ask the question part nine, who settled the Americas after Columbus? Well, I, I mentioned about the history of Western Europe. We're gonna, we're gonna revisit some of the things we've taken for granted about what it means to be of Western European descent, what it means to be an American of American European descent. So in the United States, 70% still identifies as Caucasian. Well, what does that mean genetically, historically? Who did, who did we come from? So we'll do that in episode nine, begin to look at some of the genetic data and then explore historical scenarios. And I don't want to give away too much here because there's some mysteries that we're going to have to solve. Again, really shocking, crazy things that no one would have thought that cast how we think about ourselves and who we came from in a dramatically new light. Okay, well, we look forward to part nine and part 10. And for those who want to view all the parts in the series, they can go to the Answers in Genesis YouTube channel. We have a playlist there and you'll be able to go back and watch them all again. And really looking forward to the book coming out in 2021. Thanks, Dr. Jensen. And we look forward to seeing you next week for parts nine and parts 10. Thank you.